I'm Lucy. Yeah. All right. Ooh, it's a nice, small, intimate group. Thank you all. All right, so I'm Fiona Galli uh, Fiona Gallion. I'm going to introduce uh, our topic today. Oh, and we do have a clicker. Good. Perfect. All right. Uh, we're just going to introduce ourselves briefly. Hi, I'm Sadia Akhtar. I'm the Associate Dean for GME and uh, the Associate Dean for Training Wellbeing at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. All right, and I'm Sarah Krasaniak. I'm the Program Director at Stanford. And I'm Fiona Gallion, the Program Director at University of Washington in Seattle. So first of all, this is a very charged topic when you talk about unionization. Uh, we're just focusing on the influence of unions on the PD resident relationship. Um, we want to be very clear, we are not pro or anti-union. And I also want to be very clear, we do not oppose unionization. I think there's a lot of, of uh, again, it is a very polarized topic and we want to be very clear that we are not um, amplifying that, but we do want to acknowledge the reality of the world we live in. And because it's a polarized topic, we want to be very clear that the content shared today does not represent our respective institutions. We are speaking as three different folks with different experiences with unions, but we also really want to figure out how to live in the world that we live in, and we don't have any conflicts. So what we're going to talk about is the history um, and a legal sort of landscape of unions and why that has been uh, allowed for a landscape that is uh, allowed for sort of unionization and been ripe for unionization recently. Um, we want to talk about what the Educational Alliance is. The Educational Alliance uh, is a framework that I think is really useful for us to think about when we think about uh, the program director and um, resident. There are shifts in the dyad relationship of PD and resident from the traditional PD resident relationship when you introduce a third party. And we want to talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, and then we also want to recognize some blind spots. This is uh, when you introduce a third party and also legal negotiations, that introduces potential conflict. And so how do we make sure that we don't um, get stuck in a blind spot that can cause misunderstandings or conflict? Um, and we want to identify opportunities to align and create wins. We are all here as pro-residents. Um, how do we make sure that we amplify the opportunity for unions to be pro-resident and pro-robust educational environment? Um, we also want to allow people to talk a little bit. I mean, it, it is a polarizing topic. There are some very strong feelings about unions. Um, and. Uh, we want to basically allow people to share a little bit and, and maybe speak the unspeakable um, and acknowledge, to be honest, that when you introduce negotiating and conflict uh, into that relationship, there are new swirls and new chaos and, and new opportunities that, that get raised in that. Um, so just to explain a little bit about how this topic came up, this topic actually came up when we were sitting at the bar last year at SAM in New Orleans, and we were like, Sarah's like talking about her residents being unionized, and I'm like, oh, my residents have been unionized since 2016. Sadia is in charge of multiple residencies, and some are unionized and some are not. And so we thought this was a really neat opportunity for us to share some of our perspective and experience uh, with unions. I trained uh, in a program that was unionized under CIR. Our own residents unionized in 2016. Um, uh, and they now call themselves the Resident uh, Fellow, is RFPU, Resident Fellow Physician Union Northwest. Um, and so they have their own union. Great, and then as Fiona mentioned, I'm at Stanford. Our residents and fellows just voted to unionize last spring. Um, and negotiations started in the fall of last year and they are ongoing. And so I've definitely been in the like newer part of navigating as a program director some of the challenges that come up with um, union negotiations and um, certainly have appreciated being able to learn from others on how to navigate. And then um, I'm at Mount Sinai and we are a multi-site health system. We have like seven different hospitals and three of the sites have a union and the others don't. And I think my biggest challenge is that when we sit down at GME system leadership meetings, we have 2,500 residents and fellows. Um, it's very 
let's say, challenging when you're talking about salary increase or you're talking about benefits, we always have to remember that we have to address the union in a separate way. So that's sort of my landscape that I live in. All right, so just talking a little bit about the legal landscape of um, what has changed. Um, in 1958, that was the first resident union that existed. And it was New York City under the Committee of Interns and Residents, and that was the committee, that was the union that I was under at NYU Bellevue. In the 1970s, there was a lot of house staff uh, activity around unionization, which actually led the AAMC to influence a decision by the, NL, uh, the National Labor Relations Board in determining that actually, they decided that house staff at private institutions were students and should be classified as students. As students, they were not eligible to unionize. That put a big chill on any possibilities around unionization if you're not legally allowed to unionize or qualify as a union. So kind of important to know the legal landscape. In 1999, they reversed that and said house staff are employees. They function as employees. They have duty hours. They're actually doing all of this work as physicians. And in fact, 15% of physicians are GME trainees. So this is a large group of people that we're talking about. And when they changed this, that left things ripe to, um, for people to, or, uh, to organize and to unionize. Um, and I want to be very clear, I think that that has also empowered people as people sort of, as, as GME trainees see some of the value of unionization for their own sites, uh, that has definitely gathered a lot of momentum. So we were originally planning to do like a think pair share just so that we could get a better appreciation of what everyone's experiences are with unions. I think with this small group, actually what would work well is just to have everybody share, like what is your experience with unions? Are you at a program that's unionized? Are there questions like what brought you to this session today? Um, so I would just say let's just go around the room and, and share, and if you don't want to share, you don't have to. But um, I, I think it'll also help us understand, and perhaps, again, the benefit of a smaller group is, um, you know, targeting some of the discussion and making sure we can all have a, a shared discussion about it. Yeah. Oh, I'm just not going to pass the microphone, though, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you want to start? That's the same in Virginia. So. Same in Virginia. Like um, oh. they same same thing. They're state employees. They can unionize, but then they can't collect the bargain. Yeah. So um, yeah. So it's That's limited. Kind of I'm like, 
dude. I think I'm about the same age as you, friend. <laughs> I think that's a really important thing that we sort of also came yeah. across, right? It's like this, this like wave of unions is upon us. And I think they are very prepared and knowledgeable about it. But then all of us individuals in program leadership, and, and even as residents, right? You know, because residents talk, but like we don't know how to how to navigate. So I think that that's a really important point that really again led to this topic or this session was like, wait, you have that same problem, and like I have this question, and how do we navigate? So, Sarah. Um, That's like, it's like you're a plant for this topic, because I think we're gonna, we're gonna talk a lot about like how do programs advocate for residents and what are the challenges and then how does the union impact that. Just stay on the whole NYU like stretch here and like, introduce yourself and any anything else to add to the union uh, perspective. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we got to the dark side. Nice.
swear. My program is contentious. There are some not so subtle things about the best way you can build. But I think amongst even the super limits, you're generally pro pro I left while there's still like contract negotiations going on, but I think even while I was still there, there was like a change of like this. I think at my current institution, I know historically when nurses have tried to unionize and it's not gone over well. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I've never heard any talk of unionization in the current of this. Uh, I think either I'm not in the loop or, or historical reasons. That has not been encouraged. <laughs> uh, we're just sharing our experiences with unions. Feel free to share or not share. I just. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not an MD, so I have no experience with, with unionization. <laughs> Well, truly, Jesse is, works with our chair, um, and so also is peripherally impacted by all of the union process that happens at Stanford, um, because it really, you know, everybody gets involved in the process, so. He does. He does Yeah. That's exactly what the nut of all of this generated was gen like the genesis of all of this was exactly what you put your finger on. All right. Well great. Thank you all for sharing. And I think, you know, this is a great diversity in where we're all coming from, both in like our training levels and, and our experiences with the union. So I hope that this will be helpful. We have two frameworks that we just wanted to set the stage with because I think this is going to help us understand a bit more deeply the impact that unions can have on the relationship, again, especially with program leadership, program directors, and residents. So I'm going to start by introducing the Educational Alliance. And I have to say, uh, this should have a reference, Tilio et al. Um, in 2015 and then 2016. Um, this comes from, from Tilio and his group. So this is. This is stemming from the Therapeutic Alliance, which describes the relationship between a therapist and their patient. And he reframed this to describe the relationship between a learner and their supervisor. And we're looking at this through the lens of a resident and the program director. And there's literature saying, you know, supporting that the strength of the edu educational alliance between the resident and PD um, can impact how successful the PD is in that training program and helping that resident through their training program. So having a strong educational alliance between the PD and the resident is really important. There's three components that are then further informed by this credibility judgment. The first one is this top, the mutual understanding of purpose and goal, and then agreement on how to work towards that goal and the activities that are associated with this. These two come very early in the relationship. This is happening during recruitment, when applicants and students come and meet you and learn about your program. They want to know what you as a program director are doing to help them eventually graduate as competent physicians. They want to know what you prioritize, what your activities are. Um, and, and you share all of this in that 
realm. And also it continues through intern orientation. So again, this is all happening very early. You're establishing this upfront. Everyone should have a common understanding of what the goals are of residency of you as the program director. This third one then, the mutual trust and value, is the one that then you work on and is continuously reassessed throughout training. This is something that um, residents observe, directly observe PD activities, the things that you are doing to advocate for, for them, to support them, to protect them, to foster this safe relationship and help support these mutually agreed upon goals of training. These are all the activities that happen throughout training. So residents look at this as a core component of this relationship. And these are all further informed by credibility judgments. Telio did a second study asking residents, how do you determine who's credible and how do you determine these credibility um, sort of value to a, a, a supervisor? This comes from a lot of things, some, some clinical expertise, but there's also a lot of communication and transparency and then authenticity and motivation where some of the core uh, values that residents identified in terms of how they assign a credibility judgment to a supervisor. Again, this is continuously assessed over the course of a relationship. So throughout training, the things that PDs do to be transparent, um, to show authenticity and motivation towards uh, the learner's goals are all part of the credibility judgment and then can further strengthen or break down this educational alliance. But again, because as program directors, we are responsible for getting residents through the, the, the training process, there's a lot of feedback and um, this bi-directional communication that has to happen, and it all comes down to the educational alliance. The other framework we just wanted to review, oops, oh, they didn't do the updated. Um, I'll just, the, the other part is that in a non-unionized program, often the primary point of contact for residents is the program director, and that the program director can negotiate with the hospital, with the program leadership, with the institution, GME, but that resident PD relationship is very strong. And then we're gonna talk about how that union introduction disrupts that and shifts some of the balance of that bi-directional resident program director advocacy and communication and shifts the weight to the union and it takes some of that away from the program director. So let me, since those other sides are there. Yep. Yeah. All right, so, um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about exactly what we're talking about of how, what happens when you shift from a dyad to a triad. Um, because it, it really does shift that educational therapeutic alliance essentially between the program director and the resident. So in the traditional, original kind of uh, vision of the program director, the program director sits in the middle of the residency, they are communicating with all their residents and they are advocating using the guidelines by the ACGME. The ACGME sets out all these expectations and they continue to be more granular in order to try to establish a robust educational environment, which is what the program director wants. And the program director has the ACGME guidelines in order to use that a little bit as like leverage. Hey, we will get citations. Hey, this matters. Hey, and, and, and the program director uses those tools to advocate for their residents um, and has a fair amount of flexibility in how they use those um, in a traditional program. You get departmental resources, you have institutional resources, and when push comes to shove, you can point the ACGME guidelines. Um, but where does the ACGME kind of not work well? Because people have said, well, the ACGME kind of operates a little bit like a union. If, if you don't comply, then, then doesn't, doesn't, can't you just use those ACGME requirements? And I think there's a couple of things in that. First of all, you've got CPRs, which are common program requirements, which apply to the entire institution, so things like food and housing stipends and parking and things like that. Um, but you also have uh, specialized program requirements. And so you have specialty program requirements which don't always work in alignment. And the, the RCs, the review committees between different specialties don't always see things exactly the same and in fact can create situations that actually place undue burden onto other folks. So nephrology, when they took away the requirement for nephrology fellows to put in dialysis catheters, well that suddenly left other learners, so ICU fellows and, and EM docs to suddenly have to put that within their scope of practice and, and you know, they kind of 
that wasn't a conversation that happened between different folks. When internal medicine decided that all residencies should have caps, well, who ended up having to then sustain that burden? That created problems for emergency medicine. So, so the program requirements don't always work well in alignment. And so the ACGME doesn't always function 100% in an aligned fashion to support all programs 100%. And so there can be conflict between the different program requirements, for one thing. The other thing, too, is it's a very blunt tool. What happens if you're non-compliant with ACGME? Well, the program director can use this as a leverage of like, hey, we're going to get citations. We're going to be on probation. You've got to do the things. That doesn't mean the institution's going to listen 100%. Depends on how receptive the institution is. And so pro residents have the opportunity to put things down on their surveys. Um, and the ACGME will usually have a citation and then, you know, it's sort of this, you know, and then you have an, a, you know, some time to resolve it. Or if it's really bad and you have a horrible, devastating survey, they may actually come and close your program. No resident wants to suddenly have their program close. So there's a lot of anxiety and angst and challenges. The ECGME can't do a whole heck of a lot other than put a residency, either give a citation, probation, or close it. So it's not exactly, it's a pretty blunt tool. And then it's slow. So if it's a usual problem kind of thing of, you know, it's not, we're not talking egregious problems, but maybe the cafeteria is not open enough. Maybe you're being bullied. Maybe your program director is coercing you into something. If it's something, well, that's a little bit more egregious, but regardless, but I mean, if it's like these things where basically you might get a citation, you have a year to resolve it, maybe you get another citation, it's very slow. The whole process is super slow. It's really, by the time something changes, you may be long out of residency um, for some of the problems that exist. So the value of a union is that it's often a little bit more precision. And it often allows residents to basically make changes in a faster way, in a more precise way. So your institution may be, for example, you have access to food, but the cafeteria is open two hours a day. That doesn't really work for the 24 seven uh, resident. So you can make specific changes at your institution. Or for us, like the VA um, didn't have really, their food was, Poor, poor quality. And so there were opportunities to improve on some of the food options and the food choices and the food accessibility. Um, and you can be really much more precise and targeted um, through unions um, by making the changes, the very specific changes you want in a negotiation cycle, which is usually three years. There's been a lot of literature about burnout in residencies, and they haven't found any change in burnout between residencies, uh, residents who are in unionized programs or non-unionized programs. But there have been really tangible benefits for unionized programs. So um, housing stipends, uh, vacation policies, and in fact, even decreased rates of sexual harassment have been found in unionized programs, and, and those are good things. Um, in our program, our residents got um, better access to, to subsidized child care parking um, at night. There have been really, really tangible benefits to our residents as part of the union uh, process. So, um, and I think that's part of, I think, you know, that is one of the reasons why residents unionize is because they're looking for some of these benefits because they have a tangible impact on their lives. The problem with unionization that can exist is that it can create this conflict though. Um, Whenever you bring a legal process as part of your usual experience in a collective bargaining unit, um, that introduces negotiations. And that can be a bit of a challenge. Um, and it can be a challenge because, first of all, program directors are always stand with their residents. Program directors are always advocates for their residents. Um, and in many ways, like having a union allowed me to get certain things for my residents. So lactation stations, fought for them, but man, they got like located in the most like extreme like ends of the hospital. And when we got a union, we were able to actually bring lactation stations closer to the hospital. So it was nice to have a few things that I had been really trying to advocate for and been like throwing my head against the wall. On the flip side, in these contract negotiations, for us it's a three year cycle, um, we have um, challenges. We are, first of all, as PDs, though we stand with our residents, we're not allowed to be part of the union process. If we get involved with the union process, we can be sued for interference. It is very clear that program directors do not belong in negotiations at any point. 
So we shouldn't be coercing in one way or another. We shouldn't be, like we are not allowed to participate. And that's fine and totally happy with somebody else also advocating for the residents. However, sometimes the way that resident unions have to do the negotiation can actually harm a program and can harm a program director. So imagine you're in the middle of a negotiation, you're frustrated with where negotiations are, you don't feel the hospital is listening, and you go to the media and you amplify things. And these are real, real samples. Um, well, what happens to the person who's applying to the medical school? So you're applying to a medical school and you see this media saying, our residents are mistreated, we don't have enough, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you're applying to that residency program, you might think twice. And that can harm the program and the program director in recruitment. And it actually harms the residents too because they may actually be turning off colleagues. Um, in our last negotiation, uh, not this year, but the last year at the end of the negotiation cycle, the residents uh, decided to boycott the ACGME survey. That's a really big thing for a program director because if you don't get 70% on your uh, ACGME survey, you're going to get a site visit and that's going to be 100, 200 hours of work um, to prove that your program is good. So I think we have to find ways to advocate with our residents without being you know, guilty of interference, but also try to find ways where residents can get their voices heard that don't create so much stress and pressure on the program directors. Thank you, Fiona. So I'm gonna sort of switch gears a little bit and really talk to you about what really happens psychologically when you're dealing with conflict negotiation or like decision making? Because I think as a, so I was a program director for 13 years and um, I trained in an environment which did not have a union. My residency when I was the PD was not unionized, but like I said, I'm in a health system where some of the sites do have unions. And I think a lot of emotions uh, come awry when you are dealing with individuals that are partly in a union versus others that are not. So just to sort of over the next couple of minutes talk to you about what you as a program director or faculty member need to understand when you are in a unionized situation and what really is coming at the table. One of the biggest things to understand this concept is naive realism. And we all do this. We're human beings. We're creatures. We're social beings. We interact with a lot of people. And it is this unfortunate circumstance that we don't realize that when we look at the world, we think that we're looking at this world with a very open mind, that our past experiences, the way that we were brought up, the information that we had, perhaps maybe as a program director, you feel that you're not influenced by the fact that you trained at a union program, or perhaps you did not train at a union program. The idea here is that naive realism really results in this concept of, unfortunately, not being cognizant of the fact that you're bringing biases to the table that you don't even acknowledge. And when you're dealing with like negotiation going on with the residents and the union and the hospital, unfortunately, as program directors, we have emotions, we have feelings. And as Fiona was saying, that unfortunately, we're not able to exhibit those verbally, you know, written down in language in black and white. And it's really tough to understand that naive realism is existing where you think that exactly this, that we don't see things as they are, we, we see things as we are. And that is a huge concept to come into play when you're talking about the stages of cognition. And one of the things that, you know, in preparation for this lecture, I really was very interested in is also sort of changing this to the dynamic of meetings. When you look at naive realism, it's like at the early stages, very solid, very rigid kind of thought process going on. But when you're talking about decision making and you're in meetings, it's very interesting. Some of the real large businesses out there with the CEOs, et cetera, actually have talked about how everyone should be at the level of stage four, where you have this fluid type of concept of thinking about things, about decision making, where in fact they plant people in like all these strategic planning meetings to have someone there who disrupts the conversation, who really makes people think outside of the box. And when you're dealing with residents who are very somewhat rigid in their thinking, understanding that, well, the hospital down the street has a union 
and their salary just went up, and they've got meal tickets, and they have a safe ride home, and we don't have any of this, why are we not unionized? And that's where the trouble starts. That's where the conflict begins when you don't realize that actually what are the facts behind all of those things that you're talking about. And we're going to mention that in a couple of slides here. So the key here is to understand that there's a lot of psychology that goes on when you're dealing with unionization and when you're dealing with conflict negotiation and you're dealing with contracts being negotiated. The idea also is motivated reasoning that believe it or not, all the decisions that you make have a basis on some sort of motivation that you have. And so when the residents are saying that, you know, we want to have X, Y, and Z, it may be motivated because they see the hospital across the street, the salaries are higher than theirs, but they don't realize that the residents across the street don't have X, Y, and Z, which is what they already have. So there's a lot of like motivation that's going on. So to break it down into like real basic daily activity, just to give you an example, let's say that you want to have dinner. You got home from a 12 hour shift and you're exhausted. In the back of your mind, you know that you want to, believe it or not, get some fast food delivered to your home. What you're gonna do is think about all the reasons of why you can't really cook your own meal. So you're gonna come up with these sort of excuses and say, well, I don't have all the ingredients for the meal that I really would love to enjoy making for myself, or I don't have enough time to prepare that meal. So that's why I'm gonna go ahead and get Uber Eats and get McDonald's delivered to my doorstep. <laughs> so that is essentially what motivated reasoning is all about. There's a motivation that you have there. The problem also comes in is that these three concepts are involved with motivated reasoning. When you talk about cognitive dissonance, this is really important because I think we do this all the time where we don't really look at the facts. And this comes up when you're trying to figure out as a resident, as a program director, should the group actually unionize or not. So just to give you a very simple basic example, let's say that your best friend is Bob. I hope there's no Bob in the audience here. <laughs> Let's say you're really good friends with Bob and everybody loves Bob. Like he's just like the best faculty member out there. But then lo and behold, a couple of days later, somebody comes up to you and says, you know, we saw Bob doing something really bad, like he was stealing. And all of a sudden you're like, Bob can't be stealing. Why would he be stealing? He's a physician, he's got enough money. Why would Bob be stealing? And lo and behold, you come up with all of these reasons why you will not believe the fact that that person is facing in front of you. And so when you have like cognitive dissonance, you're sort of like ignoring all the facts that are out there to really justify the decision that you're making. So for example, going back to the union example, the residents at the hospital that are you know, thinking about unionizing look at the one across the street and say, well, you know, they have X, Y, and Z, they've got a high salary, so everything in that hospital should be all right now because they're unionized, when in fact they're missing a lot of the facts that are back there and making that decision. When you talk about confirmation bias, that's another thing. Simple, simple example. Who likes chocolate? I love chocolate. I like milk chocolate and white chocolate. I'm not kind of like the dark chocolate person. But confirmation bias would be that now that you know that you're a chocolate lover, you're gonna go and find all the facts out there that actually say that chocolate is healthy for you. So that you can have that chocolate bar every single day, twice a day, at the beginning or end of your shift. So confirmation bias is a type of psychological form where actually you're looking for things specifically facts that will justify the decision that you're making. And all of this comes into play when seeing is believing. So what happens then is that let's say you have an item that's placed in front of you. It's a green vegetable and it looks like a flower. It's broccoli, but with motivated reasoning and like with all the other stuff that psychologically happens when you're bargaining, um, you actually think that it's an apple. And so you miss out on all the facts and you come up with a conclusion that really is very flawed. And when you do that, there's a lot of danger up ahead. So when the residents are planning or are part of a union, as a program director, you need to know that a lot of opinions get stated, a lot of stuff gets said, and I will tell you what Fiona just talked about, like how you get bad publicity for your own program. 
So I'm at Sinai. We're going through a lot of trials and tribulations right now with the sites that have unions. And the other day, our dean actually sent me an email with a picture of a truck that was right outside of Mount Sinai saying that stop treating your residents badly or something to that effect. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is exactly what we need to be right outside of our hospital in front of the whole world to see. This is just going to be great. Obviously not. And so that bad publicity can be a real, real problem. The thing to really understand is that if a program director, along with all the residents, along with the institution and the union, can all align, then things will be easy. But it's never that easy. And so I just bring all of this information up here because I think it is important to understand what really goes into place when you are trying to make decisions, how you can educate the residents when they go around saying that, oh, such hospital over there down the street does this X, Y, and Z. I believe as a program director, as the institution, it's our obligation to give facts so that you stay neutral, you present the facts, and that you let the residents really decide on what they want to do. And so with the program director role, going back to what Sarah was also talking about, the idea here is to, again, have mutual understanding. Like we said, we're not here to say residents and unions are good or bad, that unionization is a bad concept or a good concept. We're just saying that you can actually have mutual understanding. You can have negotiation that has the best outcome for all involved and ultimately sort of be creative and try to think about how you can actually advance the residency program. And so the other last part just to mention is that when you are talking about decision making, one of the most important things to understand is this concept of self-distancing, which really just means that you sort of take all your personal experiences and you take a step back and you really try to understand all the facts you gather all the right, right information that you need, and at the end of it, you really are looking at it as an outside observer. So that at the end, as the program director, you are in the middle of all of this, but you are the neutral party. And as stated before, there is no question. The number one role of a program director is to be the advocate for the residents and the fellows. And that actually is the most important thing to remember when all of this conversation starts about unionization. So we're hoping that today, you know, we just shared some information that will help. Again, this is the big elephant in the room nationally. Um, as you had mentioned, I'm in New York City. A lot of programs in New York are unionized. A lot of major academic centers in the country are now becoming unionized. And I think it's very important for us to be educated about what that actually means both at the resident level, at the student level, and at the faculty level. So with that, we're just going to open it up for any questions, any comments. We're happy to um, answer any ideas or talk about anything that you guys want to. So thank you.
is, is one of those factors. That is like 70, 60 to 90 percent, depending on the year. I mentioned cost of living is a, is a major negative of our program. So we brought that to the GME office to bring to the table for negotiations. And actually what was really great about that is we have a, we have a GME office that's really, like we have a bunch of really motivated, enthusiastic people. Because you know what happens to the table is they basically bring the median salaries to the table and they're like, hey, you guys are above the median 50% salary. But you can't compare Seattle to Michigan and it's an academic program salary. So what they actually did is they took a salary survey and they actually took all the West Coast programs and they identified what the salaries were for comparable because it's more comparable to California. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we don't have any state or city income tax. So if you basically have the same salary as California, you actually bring home another 10, 15%. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that was great for them to get a salary survey of comparable California you know, programs so that to bring to the table for negotiations around salary that, that allowed for a little bit better negotiation. I think it's important. For, to, for residents to also understand what PD can and can't do, because sometimes they see the lack of advocacy um, as not being supported by the PD, and I think it's really important to explain to residents, this is this is the extent of like what I can do, and I'm here to support you, and I want to I want to hear from you, but I also cannot I cannot go further. I'm not at the table, um, and so I think just like the validation and support, and then. Um, you know, PDs also get very caught in the middle. Oh, sorry. No, it's good. It's been yeah. recorded, so it has to, uh, to talk into the microphone. Okay. And be sure to uh, PDs also get caught in the middle, right? Most of us are employed by the institution. Um, and, you know, so also the institution has values that are sometimes different than what the residents have, and the PD gets caught because the institution is like, here's all the reasons why this is bad, and the residents are like, here's all the reasons why this is good, and the PD is like torn between these two. So I also think that just um, like that neutral third party is a is a good place to be, and I've tried to explain that to the residents as well. Yeah, and just to also add, like you know, sort of having the seat at the GME office, um, I think one of the best things that a program director can do is get as much information as possible from the GME office to really understand what are the issues that the residents are bringing up that they want to negotiate about. And it's interesting, um, you know, not to get into specifics, but one of the sites actually was asking for a higher salary when, in fact, if they went through the union, they would actually get a lower salary than everybody else. And it takes a lot of patience <laughs> to really understand all of that because I think also residents need to be educated about that as well. Um, there's a lot of false information that goes on either side. And I think it is the responsibility of the GME office to make sure that facts are stated. This goes back to like what I was saying. And also that program directors understand that too. Um, because they may be asking for things where in fact if they get those, they'll be worse off than when they were not. And I know that your colleague had to leave, but um, one of the comments that he made was about like the foreign grads. I get it. There are some places where the predominant house staff are um, IMGs. And I, I think it makes sense that perhaps maybe in a situation where there are not enough resources to support the learning environment, it does make sense. But again, if you're in an institution where there are a lot of resources, then you really need to pause and think about what exactly is being asked of the residents and can they negotiate to a point where they don't need to be in a union. Any other questions? All right, well, we just want to thank you for sharing. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I could chat until 10 p.m. about that. <laughs> <laughs> they want us to use the mic because it's actually being recorded. Well, I just, I find it fascinating, like you guys are talking about alignment, and it seems like, you know, the, the analogy that you gave of how the lactation rooms and the fact that, honestly, the union was really helpful in getting the residents what they needed and getting those lactation rooms closer. Mm -hmm. um, it's sad that this friction is between the program directors and the residents with this union here, but you guys are negotiating for the same things mm -hmm. to a different hierarchy. And somehow, like, you guys get pitted in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like, yes, it's the hospital and the corporate entity that is that hospital. I buy that a little bit, but, like, I find it also, like, kind of ridiculous that, like, we've frozen the amount of GME-funded, Medicare-funded, like, mm -hmm residency spots for three, four decades now? Three decades? Or like 1997, right? Yeah. 
I don't know. I'm not good at math. 1997. So, um, like, I mean, I feel like we're all having the wool pulled over our eyes in that regard because, like, I don't know that the program director is the enemy, necessarily the corporate hospital. I mean, yes, they have a budget. They have a profit margin that they need to meet. But mm -hmm. at the same token, like, I think this all gets back to autonomy and, like, maybe some to, to some extent pay that, like, is not being supported by the actual, like, government entity that really regulates our specialty or our, our practice. So it's like, I don't, I'm fascinated, like, what if, program directors decided to unionize, you know? Like, I mean, I say that laughingly, but like, it's, I don't know. Would like, we get some lip service then? Would we get more budgeting than the five billion that was appropriated in 97 and hasn't changed since? Like, Would we have more transparency in the IME? Um, when I first started at the University of Washington, the program directors actually would get specific funds from the IME that comes from CMS funds to their programs, which they had jurisdiction over. As the GME office has grown, that hasn't happened ever um, while I've been a program director. More transparency.